beautiful creation. It's both an acoustic panel and a green screen. I'm a freaking genius. I was going to make one of those DIY acoustic panel videos since those seem really hot with audio engineer wannabes. But I realized that the answer to the question, what's the best way to make an acoustic panel is just make someone else build it for you while you pretend to help. It's just a wood frame filled with rock wool covered with fabric. You don't need a 10 minute long video with three mid-roll ads explaining the process. You can do it. I believe in you. In the past, I've tried not to review media on this channel. That's mainly because I feel unqualified to talk about things like this. I try to leave it to the professionals like Ralph the Movie Maker or my friend Lauren. But what makes someone qualified to talk publicly about a movie or TV show or something? Well, I think it boils down to two criteria. First, you need to have a reasonably large sample size of relevant content to compare something to. And second, you need to have an opinion. It's so vague that even I meet the criteria, but my bar for making a whole video about a thing is really high. It's gotta get me like fired up. And friends, this has been bothering me for a while. So I think it's time we talk about Reasons Why is a TV show on Netflix barely based on the book of the same name by Jay Asher. I read the book. The book was okay, and I'll admit, it was that kind of young adult story that's just begging for a TV adaptation. Just based on the number and the titles of the episodes alone, I figured that it would be a good adaptation. <laughs> I think that this is the perfect example of how a story can translate well into one medium, but absolutely suck in another medium. Like, imagine if Mr. Robot was a novel. I don't think it would w work at all. I mean, I know it was meant to be a movie, but it really worked well as a TV show. The, the best TV show to have ever existed. Yeah, I will fight you. When I read 13 Reasons Why, it didn't feel cringy or bad. Maybe because back then my definition of cringe was also my personality. But, I mean, the book was alright. Even reading it now, I'd give it a solid shrug. But then they tried to take it to the screen. You can understand why. Teen drama books turned into Netflix originals? Cha-ching! But it just didn't work. Actually seeing the story, as opposed to reading it, revealed so many problems with the story itself. And then someone, a real human, like you and me, uh, thought in all honesty that another season or two would be a good idea. I'm going to be spoiling this show, and I'm going to be talking about a couple others along the way. Uh, so this is your one warning. If you care at all about 13 Reasons Why, Looking for Alaska, uh, Defending Jacob, Columbinus, uh, then you should turn back now because I'll be spoiling things left and right. Snape kills Dumbledore. Oh, damn it! The first season's overall story kind of adheres to the book. I mean, of course they're going to take some artistic liberties here and there because it's an adaptation, not a recreation. There are some annoying things that they seem to have just changed for the hell of it, but whatever, I I can live with that. Now, I don't want to recap the seasons. Uh, I'm sure I'll spoil some stuff, but I, I feel like my short time on this planet has already been wasted enough by just watching things, so I don't want to have to waste more time uh, going over it. I mean, I'll martyr myself walking you through a Halloween puppy, but even Jesus himself wouldn't take you through the 13 tapes. And he knows a thing or two about suffering, so the bar is already pretty high for him. Clay Jensen is your average high school guy. Definitely nothing mentally wrong with him. He's given a box of cassette tapes. They've been recorded by Hannah, a schoolmate who recently committed suicide. They are basically her note, calling people out for the events that she feels led to her decision. Also, this guy named Tony is in charge of the circulation of the tapes to make sure that everybody who has a tape made about them gets their turn to listen. The tapes detail a story of betrayal, abuse, neglect. It's not a pretty picture. The story does have its problems, but we're not here to talk about the story, at least not for the first season, because it's basically the book. Really, the first season is littered with just poor dialogue, one-dimensional characters, a myriad of problems, but there are better examples of this in the later seasons that we'll get to focus on. But the whole thing just plays like one of those Hallmark Channel movies. Like Sometimes the characters uh, feel like full-blown adults. Um, they're just out at all times of the night doing God knows what. Uh, nobody really cares, but on the other hand, you have students making hot or not lists, like this takes place in a middle school. And then of course there's Hannah's suicide scene, which I mean, the, the writers and the showrunners and the directors, they all knew what they were doing, okay? They knew what they were doing. The, in the book, uh, she ODs on sleeping pills, I believe. 
in the show, she slits her wrists wide open, ostensibly because popping pills just isn't as dramatic and isn't as headline catching. The suicide itself isn't that hard to watch. I'll, I'll tell you what is hard to watch. Uh, her mother finding her. That's rough. That's, that's a rough scene. While Clay is listening to all these tapes, there are several other storylines. I, I can't remember if they're important. I, I watched the first season so long ago, but there are a couple things to keep in mind here. Uh, first, Clay has feelings for Hannah. Uh, Bryce is a rapist. Uh, Hannah's mother is going to sue the school for the environment, which she believes led to her daughter's death. Uh, Clay reaches out to this girl named Skye to prevent another Hannah-like thing from happening. And we see just all of these kids just love to keep secrets and handle everything themselves. This season, even though there was some cringy writing, uh, it, it was okay. I really don't have a beef with the first season. In the TV show, Clay and Hannah are much closer than they are in the book, but it's whatever. They needed to drive the point home to the lowest common denominator that Clay has a reason to do the things that he does and uh, maybe set up a second season? Season 1 ended in a way that left it open for a second season, and I knew they weren't going to leave well enough alone. Because I judged the first season by its episode titles, I decided to judge this season by its episode titles as well. Uh, so now they're just regular titles because we're not tape-centric anymore. Instead, we're testimonial-centric because Hannah's mother is suing the school. Uh, but they're not terrible titles, right? I mean, they're not great, but they're not terrible. That comes later. Okay, so it's five months later, and Clay and Skye are dating, and Hannah's mom is suing the school. Uh, various students take the witness stand to try to paint a picture of bullying at Liberty High, uh, but the school's defense team tries very hard to paint Hannah in a a, a... a worldly light. The defense attacks every kid that gets up on the stand, and the judge just kind of allows this. Each of these court scenes feels so one-sided in terms of judge preference and lawyer competence. It feels like God's not dead too at times. Alex recovered from trying to jack some pollock the ceiling with his noodle, but uh, as a result, he has like very selective and uh, convenient amnesia, specifically for getting the contents of Hannah's tapes, uh, which isn't how that works. Someone is feeding Clay evidence uh, against Bryce and the other jocks. Uh, for example, in uh, episode one, he finds a Polaroid in his locker saying Hannah wasn't the only one, implying that Bryce raped more people. Oh, speaking of Hannah, uh, Clay hallucinates her now, which totally won't make his relationship with Skye weird at all. Oh, and it also turns out that uh, Skye cuts herself because uh, we didn't have one of those characters yet. Except for... you know. Adults are starting to act more like children themselves now because everybody is driven by passion and love and emotion and nobody thinks. Clay's parents get him a car, even though he did nothing to deserve it. That doesn't make any sense. Agreed. At some point, we lose track of Justin. For the life of me, I can't remember where, but we find him living on the streets riddled with guilt and heroin. So Clay does the most logical thing. Keeps him hidden in his bedroom to detox him. This season is hilariously revisionist, as the defense reveals more details about Hannah. This whole idea had so much potential, I think. Uh, the whole, both the characters and the audience didn't have a complete picture of Hannah idea, because, let's be honest, nobody knows anybody as well as Clay thought he knew Hannah. It would be so realistic, but instead they had to reveal some bouquet mowing and past bullying. It, it was just such a waste. But the season didn't really have much to grab headlines with, right? Like, the last season had Hannah and the tub and the thing with the stuff, but this season? Nothing. We've really got to rock the boat with something. And then one of the writers had the bright idea of taking this one-dimensional evil character, right, Monty, uh, and they made him shove a broomstick up Tyler's ass in just graphic detail. And all of the writers applauded, for he was the genius. He was the chosen one, sent from the gods to put 13 Reasons Why back in the headlines. At the end of the season, uh, they arrest Bryce for, you know, the rape. But he doesn't get into any real trouble, like uh, a few months probation. I'm conflicted about this, because that's a really real reality represented here, but at the same time, I know that that plot point exists just to shove it down my throat. In any other show, this would have been, like, good social commentary, but in this show, I don't know, I'm, I'm exhausted already, man. It's, I get it, around every corner is a message, just, just, yeah. Hannah finally gets a funeral, and at the funeral, uh, Clay lets go of Hannah, and she's finally allowed to be at peace. 
which is good, which means we're done. We're finally- Oh god, what the hell is this? What are these children doing? The writers spend the entire season setting Tyler up for this big cliffhanger at the end. We haven't talked about school shootings yet because we couldn't figure out how to shoehorn it into the series, uh, until now. This is probably the best example so far of how corny it is that the kids try and handle everything themselves. They they stop Tyler from treating the school dance like the sake keeps under his bed, and they whisk him away to protect him. Like, why? What's What are they protecting him from? Why are they protecting him? What is to be gained? What? Now it's a murder mystery? We spend the whole season trying to answer the question, who killed Bryce Walker? Instead of asking the real question, who cares? There's so much backfilling in this season to make you feel bad for Bryce, even though he's, you know, a serial rapist. Oh, but he's also a person. Don't forget that he's a person. Yeah, that argument can be made for literally anybody. Uh, here, Hitler was a person. Yeah, lo look, here's a fun humanizing moment from these two characters' lives. Don't you feel bad about how it ended for both of them? No? That's just a little bit of hyperbole. I get that it's kind of an unfair comparison, but I have heard falser equivalencies in my life. Up until this point, I feel like the show was missing something. Like, we've covered so much in two seasons, but something just still feels missing. Oh, I know, we don't have an African one yet. Now, the show is trying to be artistic by having three separate timelines in parallel. Uh, the new character, who I don't think anybody liked in the third season, serves as the narrator. Uh, I have a quote from Cosmopolitan about this. Uh, yes, researching for this video left a dark mark on my internet history. The biggest problem with Ani was that her character simply made no sense. She was introduced as the narrator for season 3, a role previously filled by Hannah, and despite being the new girl in town, she immediately seemed to have formed deep and trusting relationships with everybody from Clay to Bryce to Tony. She also knew everybody's secrets, to the point where the only logical explanation was that she had binged seasons 1 and 2 on Netflix right before transferring to Liberty High. Let's look at these episode titles and uh, compare them. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's so edgy. Look at that. Oh, so edgy and just... Oh, holy sh... The third season's a murder mystery, and I don't think the show knows how to do that. And I don't think I could tell you better than this Vox article can. I'm going to quote it because I just got real exhausted from writing this critique and the video is already too long. Um, so, but God, does this season drag. It's just endless. Endless gray toned scenes of sad teenagers whispering exposition tensely at each other before curling up to weep over their heroin addiction slash steroid problem slash deported parents slash lost college scholarship slash insert extremely topical teen problem here. And those problems are really treated more or less interchangeably, as secrets each character hides until their showcase episode arrives, only to reveal the truth in a tear-streaked monologue that leaves Clay staring, mouth agape, at how little he understands the pain of his friends. Ani, meanwhile, is less a character than she is an exposition machine. There is no real reason for her to care about Clay's group of friends, and no reason for them to care about her, let alone confide in her as much as they do. Her narration, ostensibly her statement to the police, is riddled with one-liners that are supposed to come off as wise epigrams, but are really just obvious bullshit. Did you know that everybody has secrets? Because Ani will tell you. Ani will tell you real good. Yes, the whole season's narration was Ani's testimony to the police regarding Bryce's murder. Honestly, if I had to sit through this boring, long-winded, evasive, clearly rehearsed story, I would want to get defunded too. So Ani in this crooked blue line decides it's okay if Monty, the one-dimensional Nimbus 2000 guy from earlier, uh, takes the heat for the murder of Bryce Walker, even though he didn't do it. There's some motive, I guess, and also Monty died in jail. <laughs> I get that if you haven't seen it, it sounds like I'm making all this up, but I swear to God I'm not making this up. Also, <laughs> Bryce made an apology, I'm trying to get better tape, which is... Honestly, the funniest thing I've ever seen. Hey, you know that girl that I raped and she left tapes as her suicide note, citing that my rape was one of the reasons that she did it? One of the big reasons. Yeah, well, I can record a tape too. Feel bad for me. I screwed up my audio placement. Now the rest of the video is going to sound like trash.
So everybody finally gets their story tied up in a nice little bow. Look at that final scene. It's so nice. It's so final. It's so... No, 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 no. Please, not a fourth season. Please, please. Anything but a... I'm so tired. Can those bugs get any louder? As I was writing this script, uh, the fourth season came out, and I haven't seen it yet. So uh, I'm going to go watch the fourth season now and pray that it's worth uh, anything. Tucker then proceeded to sit through all ten and a half hours of pure teen drama torture I can't even imagine. Or maybe I just don't want to. Ten and a half hours. That's longer than a day on Jupiter, just shy of the length of an average Catholic mass. Dude, I don't know. I thought that the season was one of the less offensive ones, but I think it's just because they've gone so far off the rails at this point. I don't, I don't even know how to form an opinion on it, really. Okay, so the season opens and they're literally pontificating and they slap you with a uh, six months earlier meme so you know that it's gonna be good. I appreciate the fact that they're finally tackling Clay's clear decline in mental health. And I mean, they've finally started showing kids doing the right thing sometimes. <laughs> but I mean, season four right? It's game over, too little too late. And it's really hard for me to say the phrase, kids doing the right thing, when Clay gets his Daniel Radcliffe in Guns Akimbo moment. And the season was just so predictable. Like, I knew that Clay did all the vandalism stuff as soon as he started losing time. I figured we'd get a Mr. Robot or Shutter Island type twist, and we did. And as soon as we resolve that in therapy, I, we just don't care about it anymore. Despite the fact that it's a major plot point. And as you see Clay's mental health swan dive off a cliff, it makes him do some just crazy stuff. Okay, he incites a riot at school. He stands up a police station. He escapes a mental hospital. He literally drunk drives Zach's Audi off a cliff. Nothing happens. There aren't any consequences because he's going through stuff. Great message. And nobody else seems to get into trouble, either. Even the guy who's actually guilty for the murder seems to make peace with it. And they all have happy endings. Well, except for Justin dies of AIDS. I, I, I guess? I, I don't, I don't know anymore. What really confuses me is that the series finale actually made me feel something, which is new for the show. Maybe it was because I was watching at 3 a.m. and I always get a little unstable at night. I mean, not Clay unstable, but you know what I mean. Don't get me wrong, at an hour and a half, the series finale just dragged. But honestly, hats off to the guy who played Justin. What's his name again? Brandon Flynn. And there are some arcs that just make no sense. Like, what school in their right mind has a senior camping trip? It's like they want to encourage teen pregnancy. Tyler's an informant for the police in exchange for dropping charges about the guns that they found in the river? I just... It, it's... I will say one more good thing about this season before I go back to hating the show. The final season with Clay and Tony just sitting in the car silently while they leave their hometown? I... I waited. And waited. Because I just knew they were going to ruin the moment with more bad, worthless dialogue. But, to my surprise, the screen went black and then we got credits. I was so happy that they didn't ruin such a symbolic moment between these two characters. I mean, it doesn't make up for the rest of the show being what it was, but I'm glad they didn't screw up the last minute of a four season long show. And that's it. End of reel. No more seasons of reasons. I think we should take a break before we go on because, I mean, we still have a lot to go through. Go grab a drink, pause the video. There's still a lot to go through, right? I'll wait. You good? You ready? Okay, let's dig into it. Literally everybody who knows me is going to look at this section and be like, what? 
There's no way Tucker thinks something is too edgy. The guy will make a joke about literally anything. Which is true, but this show isn't supposed to be funny. It, it isn't a joke. In my opinion, being edgy is 100% about shock value and reaction. And when you get called out for a joke or a statement that went too far, the best thing to do is to own up, apologize, and move on. I've done it. Many have. The worst thing you can do, however, is to say, ah, but it made you think, didn't it? I'm just presenting realities, dude. Some people will say that to be edgy is to provoke thought, but any critical thinking caused by the edginess is accidental. It's supposed to be all shock value, which I'm all for, I'm a big fan of, but when someone tries to take the high road with their edge, then it becomes bad edge. The Vulture reached out to the writer of the show, Brian Yorkie, about some of the more graphic scenes. He defended them, of course, saying, <clears throat> We're committed on this show to telling truthful stories about things that young people go through in as unflinching a way as we can. Unflinching? Well, you removed the incredibly graphic suicide scene from the first season because, and you never would have guessed this, it wasn't a good idea to show in the first place. I think Netflix has helped provide viewers with lots of resources for understanding that this may not be the show for everybody. I mean, porn isn't for people under 18, yet kids still watch it. Atlanta isn't for white people, yet I still can't wait for season 3. 13 Reasons Why isn't for suicidal people, but it sure is a decent how-to guide. Not only for how to die, but also how to do it with pizzazz, giving the middle finger to the people you feel wronged you. Let's not sugarcoat this, Brian. The show is about a girl who is bullied at school, treated poorly by several people, raped, and then neglected by the people who should have stood up for her, and then she kills herself. We all know how the story ends, that's why we're here. Don't pretend to pontificate a bigger message as if your show doesn't romanticize the suicide as its climax. Okay, okay, yeah, sure, alright, they removed the suicide scene two years after it first aired, but you can say the same things about the broom scene. It's edgy for the sake of edginess and shock value, which itself is fine, but then they try to spin it as, we're doing important work here. I mean, give me a break! Sometimes, I think some of the conflicts, especially uh, in the second season and beyond, are just there so they can say, Ah, see? It's not just about suicide and rape. We touch on homosexuality and mental illness and uh, school shootings and uh, uh, abortion um, and uh, uh, drug addiction and um, uh, immigra immigration. But after four seasons of this preachy, high school is tough and uh, these are real problems. I, I mean, yes. The show tries to touch on a lot of serious problems, uh, real problems, that need to be discussed in public discourse, but, I mean, the show can't talk about all of them and expect it to be good at any of them. I mean, instead, it does a bad job at pretty much all of them. You know how you're trying to spread a small amount of butter on bread, but you want that butter to go to every edge of the bread, so you just kind of dig in, and sometimes you tear the bread trying to do it? Well, it's like that, but the bread is my will to live after watching this show kind of ironic. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a show that's as heavy-handed in its dramatic representation of controversial issues. Uh, there's a phrase for TV episodes like this. It's called a very special episode. Wikipedia defines it as an advertising term originally used in American television promos to refer to an episode of a sitcom or drama series which deals with a difficult or controversial social issue. Usually a show would have like one or two of these. With 13 Reasons Why, it's freaking all of them. Maybe it fits the term kitchen sink realism better, whose protagonists could be described as angry young men who are disillusioned with modern society, blah, 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 to explore controversial social and political issues ranging from abortion to homelessness. Yeah, who cares? You get what I'm trying to say. One point I'll award to the show is that the website they tell you to go to if you're in crisis is actually pretty good. Uh, one page, all the information, right where you need it, along with the cast members out of character talking about the show. And I, I think it's pretty good. This is probably just a me thing, but I get absolutely livid when writers write these very stereotypical characters in high school. It's as if they don't remember what they or their friends were like, which is fine. I don't really remember either, and I'm closer to it than most writers, but I at least remember what they weren't like, right? And I don't know a single person I went to high school with that uh, conform to the hilarious stereotypes so precisely as the characters in 13 Reasons Why. 
I, mean, I think it might be because in real high school, there's no contrived drama or forced narratives. There's slews of TV shows and movies that get it right. Uh, Lady Bird, uh, Defending Jacob, Edge of Seventeen, uh, Manchester by the Sea, Looking for Alaska. They all seem to get this sort of thing right. So, I mean, it's possible. Clearly, we know it's possible. 13 Reasons Why reminded me of this play I saw back in 2015 called Columbinus. Uh, I know I gave a spoiler alert at the beginning of this video uh, about Columbinus, but I don't think a play like Columbinus needs a spoiler alert. It's it's about Columbine, and we all know how that ended. But that's just the second act. The first act is about the lives of what Wikipedia calls eight teenage archetypes. Let's see, you've got loner, freak, AP, rebel, faith, perfect, prep, jock, production history. Oh, no, that's just the section header. But these characters just feel so one-dimensional, and their struggles just seem so contrived. And I think it's because both Columbinus and 13 Reasons Why suffer from more or less the same problem. You have one act to get the characters Freak and Loner to Eric and Dylan. So you really need to make everybody mean to them all the time in some way to justify the transition. And you see this kind of shortcutting in 13 Reasons Why as well. I mean, I get it, I really do, but in the case of 13 Reasons Why, it goes nowhere. The stereotypes stay stereotypes. The characters aren't complex until they need to be. Speaking of stereotypes, I mean, the show is really inclusive, isn't it? Like, you have people from all different ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, you have straight people, gay people, bisexual people. But it doesn't have any fat people. Yeah, when I first realized it, I didn't believe it either. But I mean, I skimmed the character list and there was not a fat character. They're all beautiful. I mean, it's fine, but that's just a very weird place for a show like 13 Reasons Why to draw its line, you know? Well, maybe it isn't, you know? At the beginning, I said that I would talk about defending Jacob, uh, but really all I wanted to do was uh, point out the realism in the children's dialogue. 13 Reasons Why seems to miss the mark here, too. It's, it's small but noticeable, you know? Also, Defending Jacob, 10 out of 10. I loved it. Please don't hunt me down and kill me, Tim Apple. I, I love your company. Please don't come find me. That statement and the fear will make more sense in another video. It's a, it's a call forward. Yeah. Why? Why is this a four season long show? I don't understand how you got the ratings, the funding, the writers to come up with new story ideas. It, it blows my mind. Here, I've always wanted to write and direct my own TV show, so let me tell you what I would have done. I would have put in more love and care into writing season one and then... Stop. There you go. You could have had an amazing show on your hands, but no, you, you went the drama route. Uh, you had to beat the dead horse because it kept spitting out money. My idea isn't groundbreaking though. Uh, looking for Alaska. That that show made me feel things. Man, the way more deserving of an adaptation than Fault in Our Stars, I think. I mean, it was so well done. I mean, sure, the kids talk like their lives are scripted by an Aaron Sorkin wannabe, but I mean, it's not cringy. I they knew when to stop. They stopped when they ran out of source material. Simple. Oh, Alaska died. Everyone's sad, especially the boy who loved her. The characters are likable. They mean things to each other and not just follow some blind loyalty. And sure, some of the stuff they do comes off as far-fetched. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it justice. Uh, go watch Looking for Alaska instead of 13 Reasons Why. You'll be happier and also it takes less time. Didn't I already say enough? I mean, you must get it by now. That 13 Reasons Why is not good. I mean, I don't think it's heinously bad. Some of the acting is all right. Uh, the technical aspects of the show are fine, but it falls apart at the writing, storyline, and morality of it all. And everybody who writes or makes videos of any kind will tell you that the most important thing is the writing, storyline, and morality. I mean, you could have had something beautiful, guys. You went the cheesy way. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I just want this to be over. Please, please just, just let me end it.
movie makes me cry every time. It's just getting me a little early. Oh, you thought I was go Oh, no, 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 no. I just... I, I mean, maybe, if the screen falls in it. <laughs> but no, no, not, not today, not today. This is dumb. <laughs> this is dumb.